from a conference, a really great conference that I had the privilege to be at uh, this last week in Kuala Lumpur. So I was uh, traveling for 25 hours solid yesterday because we were traveling with the sun. You're coming east to west. So I had the sun all the way around and um, uh, so I daylight the whole way, but I may be one of the very first preachers to fall asleep in my own sermon. <laughs> so uh, if I do, that gives you permission to, but hopefully, hopefully not. Um, we've been thinking here as a church about seven deadly sins. There are many more than seven, of course, aren't there? But, and the Bible doesn't talk about seven. Um, seven's not the list of sins that the Bible puts forward um, from Christian tradition and heritage and some uh, very famous books that were written in the, um, in the Middle Ages and a little bit later, uh, the seven deadly sins were kind of coined. And, uh, but we thought, well, it would be worth looking at uh, some of those and other problems. Catherine talked about loneliness last week. And um, I think uh, Chris is looking at depression next week. Um, so we're, we're, it's not just sins. It's, it's real, everyday issues that we feel. Sin and struggle. The kind of stuff that we're struggling with. We're also going to do things a little different today. I'm, um, uh, we're not going to have questions at the end. I will put some questions up. They're on my last PowerPoint. But we'll pause at certain points through the message for you to personally respond. There may be a moment when I encourage one or two to, to pray. If you feel that you need prayer, uh, sat, sat next to someone, you might just want to ask them. Or, or you might just feel that that's something that you could offer. But we're, we're just going to have moments of pause for quiet uh, prayer. So not to speak prayers out loud in the, in the moments. I'll give you a little bit of lead when we're, uh, when we're doing that. That means that coffee will, uh, coffee and tea and refreshments will be served at the end rather than as a break. And there will be a trolley here and through in the fellowship room as well. So uh, it would be great if you're able to stay with us and enjoy refreshments. One day in Hereford, Rachel and I lived in Hereford for 20 years. One day in Hereford, there's a place almost opposite our church building that we have been part of there in the city. Um, where two lanes, uh, very short lanes, uh, become one lane. And um, traffic is, uh, I don't know, I, are you an angry merger? You know what I mean? Are you, are you one of those who sits in the outside lane slowly so people can... I'm not looking at anyone, Claire, <laughs> you don't have to know. I'm not asking you, anyone to confess this. Or lorry drivers who pull on you can... The, the police say that it's much safer and much faster if we zip merge. Yes. Useful. I know you're not going to do it if you still feel annoyed about people coming past you while you're patiently waiting in the outside, in the inside lane. I understand. Well, this particular two lanes in Hereford can only be 20 yards beyond the traffic lights. It's not long, and nobody likes to let anybody in. One day, I came out of a church event. Uh, I think I might have been there on my own, there weren't other people around and I was locking up and I turned around and I saw two cars, in fact a white van and a car hammering at it and they were getting faster and faster and it's a 30 zone, I won't be surprised today if it's now a 20 zone, and they were hammering at it and eventually as the two merged into one the van literally ran side on into the car, forced the car up onto the pavement, thankfully there was no one there. The car then rammed the van back <laughs> and they got faster and faster, smashing each other all the way up this 30 mile an hour uh, road with housing all the way up. And I couldn't believe it. And I, eventually they went out of sight and I thought, well, what do I do? I, in the end, I, I didn't do anything. I think one turned off at a junction further up and I thought, my word, that, that's ridiculous. Um, Some time later, I was driving that little road. <laughs> doesn't quite go where you think it might go. Um, and uh, a lady in the inside lane uh, didn't want to let me in, so I eased off and I pulled in behind her. But it was obvious that I could have got past her and I was a bit miffed, but I, I didn't just dip to the end. I didn't say anything, I didn't do anything. But she was furious and she started honking the horn and then she started giving me the single finger salute. And um, 
And I looked and I thought, that's one of the teachers from my girls' primary school. <laughs> so I weaved. <laughs> and uh, she was still going at it and she didn't, and then I think she looked properly in a mirror and the hand went down and off she went in a different direction, probably not at all where she lived or where she was going, <laughs> just to get out of the way. A few days later, I was in this school. I was chair of governors, I regularly did school assemblies in the school. And I walked into the entrance area, and there she was. And she looked at me and she went. <laughs> and she walked up to me, and she held her arms out, and she hugged me, and she said, I know, I know, I'm going to say, I know, I'm so sorry, I know. And that was all that was said, but two incidents on one little stretch of road that made me think about anger and the consequences of anger and what happens or what could happen when we're angry. It would have been very easy for that van and car to have killed people, not just themselves, but innocent, ordinary people minding their own business, walking along on the pavement. Well, thank God that that didn't happen. Do you have a problem with anger? Do you know someone who does have a problem with anger? The, the first appearance of the word anger in the, in the Bible gives an insight into how serious a problem it can be. And it appears in the book of Genesis and chapter 4. By the way, when I was looking at, at the word angry or anger, I thought... I wonder if the first appearance of the word anger is when Adam and Eve sinned, that God was angry. But you know, it doesn't say that. I, I reread the text yesterday. God wasn't angry. In fact, there's a deep sense that God was disappointed. God was heartbroken. But, but we don't read there. We do other places in the Bible of God's anger. But we don't read there of God's anger. I thought that was quite touching. The first appearance of anger is not a good appearance. Not Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve and she became pregnant. And when she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help I have produced a man. And later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. And when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift. But he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. Cain became angry with God. As it seems, and we'll see in a moment when I put the next verses up, it seems that um, his offering wasn't accepted because there was hidden sin in his life. In fact, look, look what it says. This is his brother Abel speaks to him. Uh, sorry, the Lord speaks first of all. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. I don't think this is particularly about the offering. Sometimes we preach that, well, we're, a lamb has to die, blood has to be shed. It's, uh, he should have offered a lamb. He should have um, shed blood because the Bible is pointing always to Jesus who shed his blood for us. But it seems there's something else going on. Do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So that this, there's this anger that's bubbling up inside Cain, the older brother of a uh, son of Adam and Eve. And um, the very presence of his brother Abel seemed to rile him even more. So Cain was angry, but then he turned his anger at his brother. His brother's existence, his brother's acceptance, his brother's standing before God made him even more angry. And it led him to murder. The first family devastated by anger overflowing into murder. Of course we know the commandment, do not murder. But Jesus dramatically draws us back to this first story, this first occurrence of anger, when he speaks in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not 
murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. If you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Jesus is not exactly saying anger is the same as murder, but Jesus is saying anger is the root of murder. If you allow anger to grow in your heart, if you allow anger to be aimed at someone, anger will lead to sin, and sin is devastating. Because God gets angry, and God's without sin. Have you ever been angry, those of you who've had children, ever been angry with your children? And you know that there have been occasions when you've been angry and acted in righteous anger, in how you've disciplined them, and other times when you acted in unrighteous anger. You know the difference? The difference is that my mum and dad, um, when I was growing up, would um, use uh, corporal punishment. They would discipline me. I'd get a slap backside. My mum and little Cain, I'm not complaining. I don't want you to report them. They're with the Lord now, so there's nothing you can do about it. I, I don't think, by and large, it did me any harm, except one occasion particularly that I remember. I remember talking to my dad about it, but once I, I was probably being a bit stroppy and a bit annoying, and I, I, I you know, I think the door slammed, and I don't remember slamming it, but it slammed, and I heard my dad's footsteps, boom, 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 and I ran up the stairs, doo, 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 doo. and I heard my dad come after me, boom, 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 and I went into the bathroom, and I shut the bathroom door, and he put the door in with his shoulder, and he came in, and he threw me over the bathroom, pulled my pants down, and walloped my backside, and I remember it for years, because I think it was wrong. Now, I have some of my dad's tendency, and my wife, don't look at me like that, I love you. <laughs> I have some of that tendency there. It's funny how these things pass down with the generations. You have to identify it. We're going we're gonna to look at the steps to deal with anger. Now, I asked you earlier, have you got a problem with anger? I'm not asking you to put your hand up. I'm not asking you to stand up. But if you've got a problem with anger, or perhaps there's someone in your mind and you know they have a problem with anger, or perhaps you're in a relationship or have been in a relationship where someone has got a problem with anger, that's really hard to live with. And that's really tough. The link between anger and evil is pointed out elsewhere in the Bible. Psalm 37 verse 8. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. So the warning is clear, Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. Friends, anger is a problem. It's a root of terrible evil in our world. And it can be a root of terrible evil in our lives. It can cause devastation in families. So as I was thinking about this yesterday, I thought, well, what causes anger? What causes anger? For Cain, at Cain and Abel, it was hidden sin. We don't know what it was, but the Lord said to him, do what is right. There was sin that he wasn't dealing with. You know, it's not okay. That the, the New Testament makes it quite clear that when we come to worship God, but we've got sin in our heart against a brother or sister, Using the Old Testament example of bringing your sacrifice, your offering to the temple. The Lord says, leave your sacrifice at the altar. Don't worship. And go and make things right with your brother or sister. Go and sort it out. Go and put it right. If you need to apologize, if you need to confess, if you need to ask for forgiveness, you go and sort it out and then come and worship God. And sometimes too many of us are just too, too easy in the sense that we think, well, you know, I haven't lived right for God this week and I've made a mess of my life. But, you know, it's all right. I can easy come, easy go. Listen, by the way, what I'm saying is not a reason to stop you coming to church. I believe it's here that you can be convicted, perhaps, by the Spirit and make things right. 
then it can be put right. I think when we remove ourselves from the fellowship of God's people, that we can end up being isolated. Catherine talked about loneliness last week. And one of the, the burdens of loneliness is isolation. And for us, if we want to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, isolation is a terrible thing. We need one another. We need one another because sometimes I need a brother or sister to say to me, hey Martin, I don't think you were right the way you spoke. I don't think that was right the way you acted. We need one another for accountability. He said he had hidden sin and then he had envy. Anger is usually a sign of unease or a lack of ease. The word dis-ease means absence of ease. Dis-ease. And so I have a lack of ease, a lack of peace, a lack of contentment. Anger is usually a sign of that lack of contentment. And often anger is aimed at those who are completely innocent in the whole thing. They've had nothing to do with it. Let me give you some examples. Children can suffer at the hands of an angry parent. The angry parent may have had a really bad day at work. You ever had a bad day at work? No. Okay. One or two. Or perhaps you've just suffered in some terrible traffic, some idiot pulled out from the inside lane and wouldn't let you zip merge. <laughs> and that can make us so angry. Bad day at work, bad traffic, running late. We're not coping with the difficulty that we've got in our own lives. Or maybe there's an illness or a problem in the family. Circumstances are bad news. I have been angry or bad tempered with Rachel or my girls because of one of the above and probably at some point all of them. But you know what? It wasn't okay to be angry with them because of something that was out of my control. It's not okay. It's not okay. They didn't cause my anger. But blaming bad traffic or a poor day at work is ultimately shallow. Angry people are angry sometimes because of something else. Or sometimes, let me dig down a little deeper and try and find out what's right in the roots of anger. I think maybe sometimes we're angry. And I speak as someone who has continued to seek to walk with God so that my anger, I, I hope if you spoke to Rachel, I'd be very happy if you speak to her, I hope if you chat with Rachel afterwards and say, does Martin's words add up to his life? I hope that my inherited and sinful anger is not as much an issue as it used to be. I think it's something that God's been dealing with in me, allowing me to find contentment. But I think angry people are angry because they feel they are owed something. But they're not necessarily sure what that is. They feel they're owed something, but they're not necessarily sure what that is. You see, Cain felt that God owed him. What do you mean you accept my brother and don't accept me? He was angry with God. But maybe he felt, well, I can't really be angry with God. That's ridiculous. So... Maybe your anger is at God. Maybe you feel, let, let me put it in words that you might understand. Maybe you're not a regular church goer, quite new to uh, coming to Queensway Chapel. Or maybe you're not yet committed to following Jesus. So maybe you use words like, luck isn't on my side. Or the universe is against me. You heard friends talk like that? The universe is against me. Or no one understands me. In brackets, said in your head, but not out loud, even I don't understand me. You see, that's that sense of being owed. As though something good should go my way, or everything good should go my way. This anger that we find hard to explain is present in many of us. We feel that we are owed something. We don't know what, and we may be sore with others and we're angry well if that is you can i can i say that step one on the road to recovery is acknowledge you have a problem step one we're going to take a moment of just stillness just 30 seconds for this moment to allow you to say lord you've put your finger on a problem 
and acknowledge it before him. Let's be still and to silently pray. Yes, Lord, that is me. Maybe you could say that I'm angry. I feel that I am owed something. Lord, I acknowledge my anger. Secondly, angry people aim their anger at those who expose their failure. So although the words are the Lord's words that are spoken to uh, Cain, you will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you don't, watch out, it'll get worse. Sin is crouching at the door. Abel, his brother, was the daily reminder that he was a mess, out of sync, broken, sinful, and his brother was right. I got things together. You ever get angry with people who seem to have it together? Like they've done something to offend you? The psalmist in the, in the Old Testament, many of the psalms begin with the psalmist, even David, complaining about how all these terrible people have everything all sorted. Lord, how can the wicked be so wealthy? It's ridiculous. So sometimes the presence of a good person, an upright person, a forgiven person, a kind person. You know, sometimes kindness can rile us even more. Have you ever been in such a mood that when someone's come to offer you forgiveness, kindness, gentleness, care, you throw it back in their face, or at least you feel it, because you're just so mad. <laughs> Is it just me? <laughs> just me, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I think some of you feel this too. I think some of you are like, yeah, I felt that. I know what you're talking about. And so his anger with God and everything becomes focused on his anger at his brother. God puts it so eloquently. You'll be accepted if you do what is right, but if you don't look out, it will get worse. Sin is crouching right at the door. My wife um, uh, often in the past uh, wouldn't have put it quite so eloquent, eloquently. Um, my wife is eloquent. I was thinking what a great job she did leading this morning, but she would sometimes be just more blunt. You're being an idiot. Yeah, ever heard anyone say that to you? You're being an idiot. Listen to yourself. It's true. If step one is recognizing your anger because you feel owed something, then step two is acknowledging that your anger hurts others. You see, anger isn't just about you and God. Anger is about you and others. You see, the Bible is very clear that sin breaks relationship with God in the vertical. My relationship with God is broken. I'm angry with Him. I feel owed by Him. I'm annoyed with Him. And now my anger overflows into my relationships with other people. And I destroy my relationships. I break my marriage vows. I alienate my children. I fall out with my neighbours. Anger can do that. So let's take a moment again just to simply quietly pray. Perhaps there are those that you know that your anger has hurt. Maybe it's time to just confess that to God. Name them in your heart as you pray. Let's be still. At the end, we're going to have an opportunity when there's refreshments. If you'd like to be prayed with uh, by someone at the end, you can either just make your way to the front or you can ask someone to pray with you. I don't want you to take this and carry it away. We, want, we can get this 
dealt with and get a step forward this morning that will be the significant foundation to deal with anger for the rest of your life. God is the God of renewal, of transformation. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. You do not have to live like this. You may be telling yourself, I'll never get through this. I'll never change. I have tried. Well, that brings us to the third point. So the Lord tells Cain in a very straightforward home truth way, subdue it, master it, master it. Take control of it or it will take control of you. Like all sin, if you cannot control it, it will control you. You, which is why one of the fruit or part of the fruit of the Spirit is called self-control. The Holy Spirit, God in us, gives an, us an ability to have control over things that used to control us, but no longer need to. And that's what being filled with the Spirit is like. Anger, like all sin, will master us, and we will be its slave. Perhaps you have tried to control your anger or other sin and repeatedly failed. So therefore, and there's only four steps, and then I'll take a little bit more time leading into step four, but step three is simply this. Acknowledge that you are helpless to change by yourself. You have wrestled with this, and you are feeling defeated. Now listen, your issue may not be anger, but we've been going through some of these other sins, and some of these other problems. And it may be that this morning, the Lord wants you to substitute what it is in there that is mastering you. And I want to take this moment for you to just acknowledge to God that you've tried and you keep failing. Let's take a moment and be still. And then I'll lead us in a prayer before we move on to the final step. If you're feeling really convicted about this, don't. Church is a safe place to allow those things to come out. I don't don't sit and keep a lid on it here. Allow the Holy Spirit to to lance the boil, to pierce the blister, to let it into the air. Lord. I acknowledge that my anger is against you and I confess that my anger hurts and damages and destroys relationships. And Lord, you know that I have tried to control it and I confess that by myself, I cannot. Amen. So how can we be free from sin, whether it's anger or whether it's something else? This is from Galatians. These are uh, the first, I think, verses 3 to 5, first of all. And this is Paul writing to Christians in uh, what's now modern day Turkey, but an area they called Galatia. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. We couldn't control it. It controlled us. You see? That's what a slave is. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Did you get it? God sent his son to buy our freedom. You are a slave in the marketplace, subject to any sin that sits upon you, whether it's anger, whether it's lust, whether it's bitterness, whether it's pride, whether it's envy, whatever it is that's controlling you, you're a slave in the marketplace and the masters, the sins of this world are taking ownership of your life and Satan's having his way and you can do nothing about it until someone else comes into the marketplace. And he doesn't look like the other owners. There's something special about him. And he comes up and he reaches his hand down like that lovely picture that Rachel showed us, that video. And he takes your hand and he picks you up and leads you out of the slave market and takes you to his home. 
And you think, well, what now? And he says, my home is your home. My house is your house. Everything I have is yours. You're no longer a slave. You're a child of God. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus died on the cross to pay the price to free us from sin. You can be free from anger, free from sin, because at the cross Jesus suffered once for all, as Ken prayed earlier on in our open time of prayer. On the cross he suffered for your sin, your rage, your anger, your temper. He experienced it to buy freedom from it for you. Freedom from your slavery to anger. And that's not all because it says, just read that last uh, line and a half again. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Dad, Father. Now you're no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Did you get that? He came into the slave market. He paid the price for your redemption. He brings you out of the marketplace. He takes you to his home. He says you're my child. And then he inputs, infills into your life his Holy Spirit to come. And to enable you to do what you could never do before. See, the Old Testament puts it like this. The promise is that my law shall be written on their hearts and on their minds. Now, how can that happen? Well, the only person who fulfilled all of the law, that is, did not keep the commandments, was pure and perfect in every way, without sin, is Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of Jesus, who is perfect and without sin, comes and is imparted into our lives. And the law, by the Spirit, is complete in our hearts and minds. And we're free. I don't have to live as a slave to anger anymore. The Holy Spirit can set you free. He makes you free. He invites you to be his child. He gives you his Holy Spirit. You see, now is the time to deal with your anger or whatever sin that it is you're dealing with. Paul writes again in Colossians, but now is the time to get rid of anger. Not this evening, not tomorrow, not in a few weeks, not in a few years. Paul says, no, today, here, right here. This is the time. Don't put it off. Now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Now is the time to get rid of it. Here's what Paul says in Romans 6. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, and here's, the, here's how you get free. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. That's it. That's it. How can I be free from the slave owner who has my name? Surrender completely to God. Give yourselves completely to Him. Bow before Him and receive Him. And invite his Holy Spirit to fill you. Do not let sin control you. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. And so step forward. Surrender your life to Christ. And invite the Holy Spirit to fill you. Let him free you by the power of his cross. Ask his Holy Spirit to fill you with himself. And to make you, not just in name, but in practice, a child of God. Children look like, act like, and even if they don't want to, when they grow up, realize that they are little images of their parents. I apologize to my daughter who's here. But there are so many little traits, you know, people say, oh, just like your dad, just like your mom. Oh, you remind me of your grandfather. There's these little things. If you're a child of God, you should start to demonstrate the reality of God's life in your heart, in your attitudes, in your actions. But that comes through surrendering to Christ and inviting the Holy Spirit to fill you. So I'm going to invite you now to, um, to
to pray. And um, it may be that you want to pray with someone, but if you're new and that makes you feel uncomfortable, that's, that's fine. Please, I don't want anyone at all to feel uncomfortable. I want you just to respond. But it would be great if you felt the person next to you, perhaps, if, if, if you've come with them, um, maybe you want to pray for one another. Maybe you need to just say, Lord, or ask that person, can you pray with me over this issue? Maybe your problem is not anger. Maybe it's something else. But you know, the solution is the same. The blood of Jesus shed to set you free and the Holy Spirit indwelling and infilling your life to allow you to live free. Set free by the death of Jesus, living free through the Spirit of Christ. So let's just uh, be still. And uh, after two or three minutes, um, I will lead us in a, in a prayer and then we'll move on to a closing song. In, in a few moments so let's just uh, be still and perhaps if you want to pray with someone or share with someone now would be a good time to do that let's take a few moments to do that. Father, for hurting others, responding in anger and with sin. Lord, I confess that I by myself cannot control my sin. But I thank you that you know. I thank you, Jesus, for bearing my anger, for taking my sin and my shame and paying the price for it on the cross of Calvary. Father, forgive me and make me new. Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me now and give me the power today and each day to turn away from anger and to be filled with your tender heart and with your mercy. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.